Hi everyone. I just wanted to start off with a few administrative notes before we begin. So all attendees today are on listen mode. After the end of the presentation, we're going to give you a chance to do a Q&A. But if you do have any questions that come up during the presentation, please feel free to go ahead and type that in at the questions pane within your control panel. And if for some reason your control panel is not expanded, there's a small orange box at the top left-hand corner of your panel, and it's got a little white orange, um, white arrow. Just go ahead and click on that, and it should expand, and you'll find your, um, your question section. Um, also, at the end of this webinar, you'll receive a survey. We'd love to hear from each of you on topic suggestions you'd like us to cover for future webinars. And this webinar is being recorded, so at the end of this, we'll send you a follow-up email so that you can watch this if you miss any part of it um, or would like to share with any one of your team members, please feel free. So with that, I'd like to start by thanking you all for joining us today with, for Reframing the Way Brands Grow. I'm Samantha Gunther, and I am the Director of Marketing and Events for Dependable Solutions Incorporated. And as you know, every company is under pressure to grow their footprint and their presence. They need to hit their targets from within the structures they already have and in ways that are consistent with how they've organized. So today we're joined by several industry experts. We have with us Peter Kalinkio, Managing Partner of Licensing Brands Incorporated, a brand licensing agency. Pete has worked for Coca-Cola's licensing program, the Olympic Games, Kmart, just to name a few, and has extensive connections within sports marketing. Mark DeSoma, we have here, sorry, um, is a creative brand strategist and founder for the Audacity Group. He has strategized and led a range of complex multi-year corporate and brand transformation projects in New Zealand and Australia. Both are here to demonstrate through several case studies how top licensors are utilizing brand expansion through licensing to help maximize shareholder value and meet their long-term business objectives. We also have Marty Malis, President of Dependable Solutions, Inc., a web-based software solution for licensors, agents, and licensees. And Marty's going to describe to us how clients have used automated tools to help rev leverage their brands by spotting opportunities to grow their businesses. And with that, I would uh, love to introduce you to Pete, Mark, and Marty, and uh, thanks for joining us. Would you guys like to get started? Hi, everyone. This is Pete Kanlikio. Welcome. Glad you're here. We've been doing a great deal hi. of research on... Oh, go ahead, Mark. No, so I was just saying hi. That was all. Get started. Sorry, Pete. Sorry to interrupt. <laughs> No worries. I just wanted to share that we've been doing a great deal of research on brand licensing as part of a book that Mark and I are writing. It's given us an opportunity to talk with some amazing people about how they see the industry we're in and the challenges we face. We've also had the opportunity to talk with them about how they've used licensing to grow brands, achieve the best shareholder value they can, and meet their long-term business objectives. So uh, let me just quickly cover with you what we'll be uh, what we will be covering today we're going to talk about the next era of licensing so that's about rethinking how growth works we're going to talk about the new meaning of brand which is about rethinking what we're growing and finally let's talk about the huge role that equity plays because equity is all about building on what consumers love yeah absolutely and and uh just wanted to share, these are some of the companies that we've spoken to. It's been a fabulous opportunity for us to talk to these subject matter experts in everything from companies like Hasbro and Disney and Major League Baseball and Coca-Cola and Entrepreneur Media and Turner Classic Movies and, and actually dozens of others and, and we're looking forward to sharing our insights with you today. I think that um one of the things that we want to talk about today, and it's particularly pertinent uh, as, we, uh, as we 
think about year end and plan for the year ahead is the whole concept of growth. So growth is something that you know we all talk about and that gets talked a lot about in the business press. You know, but the reality is that when you actually stack the numbers, the goals don't get hit to anything like the extent that people most likely think. In fact, <clears throat> excuse me, there's some research from Bain recently that shows that um, just 10% of companies consistently hit their growth targets over a 10-year period. In other words, 90% of companies fail to hit the objectives that they have set themselves over the period of a decade. So I think what we're talking about here is something that is uh, talked about a lot, but actually much more difficult to achieve than it sounds. And so one of the things that we're interested in and that Pete and I have been talking to people about um, over the last year or so is why is it that when people talk about growth strategies, licensing doesn't get anywhere near the amount of attention that it's supposed to. I mean, it's still seen by too many in our view as a way to sweat the assets, you know, rather than as a powerful growth mechanism in its own right. And I think the other thing also we've found is that licensing and marketing, and Pete, you, you said several of the companies you've worked in, you've found this to be the case. Licensing and marketing have tended to operate as separate parts of the business. And Absolutely. so there's been this, you know, there's been this this lack of coordination and this um, lack of shared market intelligence. So there's a, this challenge to grow, but companies aren't working; they're moving parts together to make it happen. I'd like to bring Marty in at this point. Marty, what are you? What What are your experiences in terms of how companies are using? Um, their uh, their assets and uh, or particularly their equity. You know, when, when you look at when you look at examples like Walmart, for example, what are you seeing? Yeah, thanks, Mark. The um, the thing we found is that uh, you are correct. Is brands uh, marketing and licensing tend to sometimes you know work against each other because one side saying, hey, let's market what our company does. The other one is, hey, let's go through our extended licensees to to help build the brand across all of the values of the company. In fact, Hallmark is a, is a value-based company. It's a private company, very large. Um, and really through their different values of affirming, creative, genuine, and the best products out there, they're looking to build the equity for the brand through licensing so that they can actually extend to the millions of loyal customers out there to the type of products, the high quality products to build on their brand. So it's building up the equity of the brand and reinforcing the core products they're selling, but it's by doing it with third party licensing. And it's an important part of, of keeping that brand. And we'll go through other examples of that where those companies have realized that they don't have to make everything, but they just have to make sure that the brand equity and value is consistent across both licensed and manufactured and sourced goods for each company. So yes, it's exactly so when, the case. So when you think about a company like Hallmark, for example, I mean, there's an industry that on the face of it looks like um, it would be under huge competition, you know, both from other players and also, you know, digital channels. How dependent are they, have you found, on licensing to help continue to um, expand their brand? Well, I mean, licensing has been core to their business because, you know, as you know, um, the millennials are thinking Hallmark is an entertainment company. For those people who are older, are thinking that Hallmark's a card company, you know, mm -hmm. and so they're trying to keep themselves current because they are all of those. But what you may not know is Hallmark is also Crayola. They bought Crayola many years, 20 plus years ago. Oh, wow. And Crayola is a division that has been extremely aggressive and now they have their new little characters out there, their games. And so they connect, but you probably didn't realize it, but like with their Crayola brand, they're connecting to obviously a very young consumer and carrying that all the way through. So they're a company that knows extensions and impressions very well and they're getting the getting the people involved in their brand. But extremely mm. good at doing that. Mm. Okay, cool. Well, 
Those are great examples, Marty. Hallmark and Crayola, they, they've done a fabulous job, both those brands. And, and really, if we, need, if we want to find a new role for licensing their growth agenda, and, and I'm excluding companies like Hallmark, we need to make licensing a bigger part of the conversation, or in fact, a part of the conversation. And to do that, we need to change the perceptions that many people have of licensing. And the best way to do that is to stop calling it licensing. We haven't figured out exactly what to call it yet, but we just don't want to call it licensing anymore. In fact, um, you know, it was really interesting when we talked to Simon Waters, who heads up the uh, consumer products business at Hasbro. His view is that licensing has constrained how we perceive the entire business, and it's also constrained how we act. And so they've changed their their name to consumer products. And it's really empowered them to do a lot more than they had in the past. I think the key thing in what you've just said there, Pete, is how it's perceived, isn't it? I mean, if you think about it, marketing people, I, th I know from where I've come from, you know, from, from years of working on the brand strategy side, that licensing never really entered my arena and my full awareness um, until I met you. And then we had a long conversation about how brand and strategy and licensing all need to work together. And I think one of the things about that is that um, people in licensing, I mean, what's become very clear is I've watched and, and, and the case studies and listened to the interviews and, and as we've talked to people is that people in licensing have got much more ability than they're given credit for by the wild, wider uh, marketing community. You know, I think when you look at it at its best, and Marty's, you know, touched on some of those examples, you know, this is a highly creative craft, and it can actually revolutionize um, how brands think about themselves, and also how they integrate and um, coordinate their consumer interactions. And it seems to me that in a flat growth era, that is so important, because, you know, if you think about how brands are trying to perform today, you know, they've never been under more pressure to meet consumer demand quickly. They've got to stay interesting and in a world where attention spans continue to shorten, and they've also got to coordinate what they're doing um, across multiple markets and, and multiple channels. So again, I'd like to bring Marty in at this point. Marty, what do you think um, are the key messages um, that license, uh, license, licensors and the licensing community generally needs to be reminding marketers and companies generally in terms of what it can do and the difference it can make. Well, good, good point, Mark. The um, the challenge you have is with uh, like one of our clients, Chelsea Football Club. You know what is licensing? Licensing is, you know, do we know who makes those goods and who's controlling it, who's enforcing it? So you have endorsements, you have likeness, you have the actual products being licensed. You have all these different things that are going on in the programs of the companies to bring in the money, to buy the players, to upgrade the stadiums. Then you also have, um, you know, in this case, direct licensing, where they're tracking a hundred different licensees around the world, sub licensees, agents, and using systems um, to do that, to be able to spot what trends are happening, what's happening in Asia. And one of their endorsements is, uh, you know, uh, Karaboa energy drink out of Thailand. They're obviously sponsoring an English football club because of the effect it has on those drinks in Thailand. Yokohama Tires is a Japanese-based tire company, and they sell across the world. So don't you know? Don't think they're only in Japan, but they see the value in sponsoring a, a British football club because uh, you know they're able to then empower and sell more tires throughout the entire world. And at the end of the day, and Nike has the the kit, you know, the kits and uh, jersey sales there. So you know. That's a $60 million a year deal for both of the tires and the Nike. And then you've got all the income and the quality control and endorsements and tracking of all of the players as they're grouped together, the actual uh, licensees and all that information coming in. So embracing that across all these different spectrums is important, but they have to be able to do it wisely and be able to spot the opportunities. And one of those ways is just 
keeping an eye on the detail associated with that. So that's, that's how people are doing it today and doing it in a systemized format. And I think what you've just alluded to is something really interesting, and that is the fact that you know we tend to think of licensing as being about deals, but what you've just talked about, which I think um, you know is also worth remembering, is you're talking about joint ventures, you're talking about you know you're talking about special projects, you're talking about sponsorship deals, you, you know you're talking about um, a, a wider um, endorsement and use of the brand than perhaps. Uh, has been framed around the word licensing, and so m one of the things that that we're very keen to think about is exactly that: that you, we should stop thinking of licensing as just pure um, deal making, and start to think of it as how companies build relationships more broadly across uh, with their consumers through a range of touch points. So does that seem? Does that seem a? a do, is that your take out from the Chelsea story? Yeah, I mean it's um, well, it, it 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 does help that they're number one of the EPL this year, but they weren't last year, and they still have they negotiated these deals. See, they don't want to tie their success to the performance on the field because year in year out you can't win every year, and um, it's really wonderful to work with these European uh, sports organizations because you actually work with them directly because they can control their own destiny. But they are they're full 360 on looking at every opportunity, and and they did pioneer in Europe the ability to put the names on jerseys, things in the states you haven't seen yet. But obviously, I think we're seeing it. I can't remember if it's uh, some of the NBA teams are putting their uh, putting some sponsors on their jerseys. But they've done a really good job of embracing all aspects of licensing. And you're not the, the you're not. The yeah, you're not the first person to use the phrase 360, eh, Pete? When we think about our con the conversation that we have with John Field, that's at Halo. That is exactly the phrase that he was talking about about the fact that we needed to start using, you know, thinking about 360 consumer, um, uh, you know, touch points. Engagement. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. Mark. You're spot on on that one. Uh, the, you know, the word that came up time and again in our discussions and uh, has come up. Uh, I, I think in, in the ways that we increasingly think about this is we've got we should be really thinking about uh, licensing in terms of its imagination. You know, the ability to reimagine what what brands can mean, you know, in order to redefine what brands can earn. And what I think we're seeing here, and, and and I hope that we'll get to talk about a little bit more today, is that smart brands really are doing the the unexpected. You know, they're reinventing their brand to completely change not just who they reach, but how and where they reach them. And um, and and by, and of course, by doing that, what they're actually doing is is redefining the brand, or rather, the relevance of the brand itself. And of course, when we think about the imagination thing. Marty, let me bring you back in again, because I think one of the things that we're interested in is we talk about brands um, as if you know they are entities, but of course brands sit within portfolios. And one of the things that uh, we're interested in is what can you do with a portfolio to, uh, to increase uh, shareholder value? I think you've got an example around Edgewell Personal Care that um, could well be worth looking at. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I think smart. The Edgewell personal care is an interesting story because it makes sense, right? Because Edge Gel, at least that's what I use as a guy. But they mm -hmm. also uh, extend through, you know, Playtex, um, Hawaiian Tropic uh, body lotions. Um, they have uh, um, uh, Wilkinson uh, razors. Uh, but you think this makes perfect sense under Edgewell? Well. Up to a year ago, they actually weren't Edgewell. They were a separate division of Energizer Battery. And so if you look on your Hawaiian Tropic suntan lotion, you'll see product of Energizer Battery, unless you bought that, unless you bought that suntan lotion this year because it doesn't say Edgewell yet. And so they actually split the company in two, and the Energizer and EverReady stayed um, in St. Louis, and the Edgewell moved, moved back into Connecticut, and they split the company out to build shareholder value, but also it's kind of hard to sell personal care products when you're selling batteries. So mm. they really looked at this and then a wise decision to say, hey, let's split the two apart. Um, they had collected all these brands while they were at Energizer Battery very smartly from 
Johnson and Johnson and SC Johnson and other companies, and now they split them in two and have two separate publicly traded companies. And that just happened last year. And now they're able to take both brands and move them in the direction under their corporate names that make most sense. Now they're going through um, and, and opening up Latin America and other areas that are just really extensions of these brands. But in this case is, yes, it did require them to actually split the company in two to build shareholder value, but also value for each brand. You have a good idea what Edgewell does now because it doesn't say Edgewell batteries. <laughs> so that's a, exactly. Yeah, absolutely. And I think I think where that gets really interesting from from where I sit, you know, and and the work I've done is this is the different use of architectures. So on the one hand, you've got a brand architecture like like Edgewell, where you're actually splitting things out by brand and pursuing um, a range of opportunities under a range of brands. But uh, we've also found, and um, Pete, I'm bring you in here because I think it's really interesting that you, when you look at a company like Bulgari, you've actually got a company that uses one brand but uses it over a, a range of sectors. Yeah, Bulgari is a fabulous example and, and you know this uh, story, Mark, but uh, Marty, you may not and, and the listeners probably don't. But I actually um, came upon uh, this phenomenal Bulgari uh, destination hotel when I was on my honeymoon uh, in 2009 in, uh, in Bali. And uh, we were driving along in a taxi and all of a sudden uh, came across it. And, and I asked my newly, newly married wife, you know, I said, I thought Bulgari was, uh, you know, into high-end jewelry. Um, and she said, no, of course, they've been in hotels, but they actually hadn't been doing it for a long time. And so Bulgari's decision to move into hotels, on the surface, doesn't make sense, but it works because it takes what consumers know about Bulgari and completely reworks it to give the brand new meaning and new dimensions and new revenue streams. So it's, it's a fabulous example of what can be if, um, if the right minds are thinking about it. And I think the, the I, I find it fascinating because it's almost like they've taken the concept of jewellery and transposed it from literally the craft of jewellery to the idea of hotels as jewels. I mean, that's how I kind of see how they've made that transposition. Is, is that how you see it, Pete? Absolutely. And it's one of those where the minds of, of the folks, in fact, um, you know, in the next slide we talk about it, uh, but uh, Silvio, Silvio Orsini, you know, this is what was going through his mind was how can we um, continue to engage our consumers in a way that they love to be engaged and what can we do that's special? And so it's that critical balance in knowing why you're growing and where you're growing into. And, and this quote from, from uh, Silvio is just absolutely captures the opportunity for brands to be saying something new and something wonderful and something unexpected. And in a world where everyone wants new experiences, bringing ideas together in fantastic ways really redefines the growth framework. I think this is a statement that every marketing um, manager and brand manager should have in very large letters um, on, their, uh, on their wall. I absolutely love this quote, Pete. Do something only if you have something to say. And I think, you know, a lot of us look at strategies that have happened and say, what did you think you were saying and <laughs> why the heck did you think anyone was going to be interested? Why did you go there? Exactly. I, I don't think they actually ask them, them themselves that question before they start to, to ask. So I think they should, if it were me, I would blow this up and put this on the wall of, you know, in very, very large letters because um, don't venture into a business just because it's there, you know, is a, is a, is a great statement. And uh, particularly, I think, if you're going to pin one brand to several sectors, it needs to be incredibly clear why you are in those sectors and why you are qualified to be there and why you have something interesting to say. Absolutely. I think the other thing that's also interesting when you think about it is, um, and one of the reasons why I think people do do that kind of level of growth is that they're trying to meet consumer demand. 
And uh, I, I, I love this, the interview you had with Tim Kilpin where he talked about the fact that you know, you don't always know where it's going to go, but you need to be able to scale to meet the demand once the demand happens, because if you don't, you know, you're literally leaving dollars on the floor. Yeah, t that conversation with Tim was absolutely fascinating. You know, Tim is a former uh, executive at, uh, at uh, Mattel and at Disney, and he just had so many great things to share, but that whole idea that demand isn't predictable and if it clicks with people, it clicks. And when they want it, you better have it. And you know, so even that—that that was the thing that was, you know, like you need to anticipate. Um, and, and even a seasoned industry veteran like uh, like Tim was surprised by Minecraft, because a lot of what we're talking about, and what we do, is about scaling, as you said, Mark. And all that's about growth. And that's why we need to change the language uh, we use with others and language we use with ourselves. We need to be talking more about the effect of what happens when we do our work well and when we take an asset a brand and we maximize the value that shareholders get from it that's when we see it really take off mm. and you know Marty I think you have a perfect example of this and it's it's one of these where I think everyone on the planet knows about it but um, what are your, some of your favorite uh, success stories uh, I think you have one in store that we're all gonna really understand and, and agree with well, it, it's it's kind of rare that you find in licensing a you know a just a rocket to the moon. It happens every so often. Obviously, we had we had one this year, and and uh, I'll tell you, my son loves Pokemon, and you know, and, and people who love Pokemon, that's great. You leave them to their Pokemon cards, and they they love the books, and they love the games, and it sells extremely well. But something happened this year in Pokemon. You know, in their anniversary year, they went through and they just hit the moon with a licensed product based on you know virtual reality technology that they did not expect. No one could have expected it. Nobody could have forecasted the success of Pokemon Go. There's some statistics up on up there that are just you know, but the you know age group of 18 to 34, 78 percent of the people who play it. But what wow. they did, they just they just hit it. So hard, and even once again, uh, work, we work with Pokemon, but just the idea that they could, like, no one anticipated this level of growth and the amount of Pokemon things you're going to see under the Christmas tree this year is phenomenal. You know, but at the end of the day, what I loved, though, there was two interviews. Solomon Thomas, uh, who is a 273-pound uh, uh, defensive player for Stanford, and Christian McCaffrey, who's a Heisman Trophy hopeful. You know, like, you know, he's probably not going to get it this year, but you know, just these, just these rock guys that are just macho, or whatever. When they were interviewed for the ESPYS, it says, "Hey, thank you so much. Something had to get me off my Pokemon Go," and <laughs> you get you get a game like this associated with people that just never played. And the extension of this brand through this one licensed property to the game development now is a common household world word. Nobody really knew it. And as you probably heard today, just next week, they're introducing the next round of Pokemon. So they have a whole lineup of characters that people, kids are exercising now, getting out um, of the house and playing a game. And But, but more importantly, Adults are being introduced to a game they never thought because it was such an effective use of a brand in society. And once again, the whole exercise part of it and these macho guys saying, hey, you know, I play it, it you know, in public and published, you're like, give me a break. So it's a fantastic use of extensions and magnifying a brand. But once again, we've never, we've never seen anything like Pokemon Go. And I would, no. I would suggest... I'd also suggest, Marty, that you know if you hadn't used like a, a licensing model to do this, you know you you'd be pretty hard pushed um, to be to be meeting the kinds of demand that you know that blew up, you know out of out of this. I mean, you'd be you'd be you'd be working pretty hard to try and get it done in a timely way. I mean, you know, we talk a lot about you know merger and acquisition M and A and about the fact that it brings forces together. But it brings forces together over long, long periods of time, you know, way bigger than than those, you know, around these kind of digital time frames. I mean, so I mean, I think one of the great things that gets missed here is that licensing offers an opportunity 
to um, to deliver to customer demand, just like Tim Kilpin said, um, probably in ways that a lot of other growth mechanisms wouldn't allow you to do. Yeah, there's no doubt the scale ability to scale when an event like this happens can never be done internally. And as you probably know, Pokemon itself is an agent for Pioneer Pokemon and uh, you know Nintendo. So they they themselves are a company around a game that was developed. And so you're right. There's no way you could keep up with this demand. And of course, you know, it was a blessing if anybody was a Pokemon licensee before it took off. But after it's been taken off, it's just the world has really opened up to so many segments and possibilities for Pokemon that um, you know the unmet demand has got to be great. And it's going to continue because of the constant release of these. It's not a one-time only thing. There's going to be another surge now with the next uh, Pokemon series going out with new characters. So, you know, it's kind of, it's a fascinating mechanism that, that was dreamed up by some brilliant people. Yeah. Mm. It's, a, it's, it's, a, it's a great story and a very inspiring one, and I think one that um, talks to all of us as we kind of meet that paradox of, on the one hand, we've got a flat world where it's hard to get growth, and on the other hand, we've got boom, and suddenly, out of nowhere, it seems, you know, an idea or a phenomenon or a cult or a brand or something takes off, and you need to have, um, you know, the mechanism. Both you need to have both the tracking in terms of where it's going with demand, but also you need to have uh, the partnerships and uh, and 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 associations in place so that you can meet that demand once once it identifies itself. Can we move on, perhaps, and talk a little bit about um, how the meaning of brand itself is changing? Because I think one of the things that's really interesting when you think about that is that licensing isn't the only word that's, uh, that's changed meaning. And one of the things that Pete and I have been talking a lot about is the fact that brand, too, isn't what it used to be. You know, w once upon a time when you thought about a brand, you thought it was, you know, about a, a brand was a product, you know, or a service. Um, but today, you know, this is a brand. You know, and and star, something like Star Wars is a brand. Um, so a brand can be it can be an event, it can be a celebrity, it can be a film, it can be a TV series, it can be a political party. You know, brand has almost come to be recognised as um, anything that is an entity in its own right. You know, and is treated as such um, by both the mainstream and social media. So if could we, Sam, if we can just flick through a couple of examples here, you know, Star Wars. There's one. There's an example. Um, look, let's look at another one. TED Talks is an example. Um, what else have we got? Mets is an example. These are all brands, and they're all brands that are uh, um, are quite different from the way we used to think about brands. And I guess the key point here is. You know that a brand is is therefore something that is valued. Yeah, absolutely, Mark, and that's the point, right? It's it's all of these kind of coming together, but it really focuses on this idea that what we're trying to do is add value and and, and to something that people value so much, such that it will start to grow. And you know, marketers they need to understand that organic growth, even M and A growth, is not going to get them the results they're looking for at the speed they need and so you know what brand expansion offers is that mechanism and you know Darren Garnum who uh, you know is now an executive at NBC Universal but formerly from Mind Candy he said that the story is a proven way to lock brands into people's lives by giving them something extra you know something unexperienced uh, and uh, a new encounter and a deep understanding and and that's, that was the beauty of what Mind Candy did. And uh, it's, it's fascinating when you see it happen. And Marty, I know you have a great example that you want to share with Ohio State and what they're doing, which is, which is a phenomenal um, brand in, in and of itself. Yeah, definitely, Pete. The, um, you know, the folks at Ohio State we've had the pleasure of working with for a number of years is you know, a challenge they have, like any um, in the states, only universities can license themselves directly or through agents. Otherwise, the leagues do it. But over in Europe, the teams can do it themselves. So, Ohio State actually owns their own brands, owns their own mascots, and and um, 
so they, they do direct licensing. They manage it on themselves. But one of the challenges with licensing at a university is they're state-owned, so they have a lot of rules and regulations, but they need to try to even out their income. They are the number one royalty-bearing um, institution in the United States. They obviously, the last several years, including this year, are doing extremely well in both basketball and football, which are the big money makers in university licensing. But they need to satisfy their number one objective, which was to bring in revenue to reduce cost to the students. And that's the one thing, the value proposition, the mission statement they have in the licensing department. The more money they can bring in, the lower they can get the cost of the students and get a better value for the students. So they really have their minds and their hearts in the right places. And in doing so, they said, hey, look, how can we do this? And one of the ways they found was to do a longer term deal. So increasing the royalties, reducing the vendors. At the same time, it, it has less factories to check for compliance because they, they are very diligent over hundreds of licensees checking, making sure people are doing the right thing because remember they're state owned. And the challenge of course is how do you maintain innovation and creativity when you have less vendors because it's nice to have people in the creative um, chasms of, you know, of brands and articles and things that you haven't done yet. So what they did of course is they did it was 97 million over 10 years with uh, J America and Lids for Lids for the hats, J America for the apparel. Mm -hmm. And then he did a deal with the $253 million, I believe it was a 15-year deal with Nike on the field kits and the jerseys. And so they're able to bring that kind of money into the university to be able to satisfy their number one objective, which was really lower the cost to the students. And I don't know if you caught this today, but they are now issuing a LeBron James number 23 Ohio State jersey. And for everybody wow. on this call, you may not know, but LeBron James did not <laughs> he did not go to college. He went straight to the NBA. But he's such right. a huge fan of the brand. And I have to compliment Ohio State. Come on. They have said, look, it's important enough through the association with Nike to co-brand with LeBron James its own jersey. For only $110, you can get it right before Christmas. But mm. it's a very creative way of a university to increase their income stream to lower their cost and they do it through a very extensive licensing program. I think that thing about income streams is, um, is incredibly important and one that we also tend to underestimate. We tend to also think of that, as I say, that old meaning of how do we produce income. We produce income by uh, producing products or services. But what we've found, which I think is really interesting and what, what this bears out, what your Ohio State University case bears out, and certainly the Disney case brings, bears out, is that it's not about what you, uh, what you make physically, it's what you make in terms of what people want more of. And so one of the things we found with Disney, that you know, D Disney used to make movies, w what they do now, of course, is that they actually create characters. And those characters are, are, the, are what people come to love, and you know, and then they take those characters, of course, and they put them in all sorts of places, including their movies. So, and that is how they they build, um, you know, they build income streams, literally out of uh, out of pixels. Uh, and one of the things that Simon Waters said um, in our interview with, with him was that we you need to create something that people want more of. So I can well imagine that you know the association with LeBron James takes a brand that is already valued and now gives an extra impetus for people to want to have more to do with it. You've, you've given them another reason to engage. And what that also does, um, you know, is it changes, essentially changes the mythology of Ohio University. It takes their story, you know, to a new place. And, and finding new ways, places for that to happen, you know, starting a story in people's heads allows you to um, take a story to new places and therefore to build uh, new opportunities and, and new income streams um, out of that. Exactly, Mark. And, you know, the one example is, you know, and this was what Tim Kelpin shared with us, was that everyone thought that, uh, you know, Disney was absolutely mad um, when they, agreed to pay, I think it was about $4 billion for the Marvel catalog, but what they didn't realize was that Disney had had a, a perspective on a much greater potential for what they could do with those characters 
than what that than what had been done before, and so they they actually saw it as a very very um, lucrative deal at four billion dollars, and of course we all know how much uh, they've maximized that, and that the value that's come from it has just been incredibly um, substantive. So. Uh, you know, it's that insight and that, that, that clever thinking uh, that really makes the difference to see that, uh, you know, the diamond in the rough, so to speak, even when that diamond is already flashing brilliantly, um, it can even be much, much bigger. And isn't the, the, seren, you know, the serendipity of that is so interesting, isn't it? That on the one hand, you look at some licensing deals, um, you know, some extensions, and you go, okay, that makes complete sense. But there are also some that when you look at them, they, they don't appear to be that obvious, and yet, and yet they work, you know. Some will work better than others, some will work better than expected. You know, what this is all about, if you want to get it right, you know, is is finding creative and engaging ways, you know, that absolutely connect, you know, with people's view of, of what they have a right to be involved in and how they want the brand to take them to a new place. So Ohio is going to take, you know, lovers of that brand to a new place through its association. And you know, I think the Monster High story is is a great example, Pete, of uh, of a brand that uh, took the zeitgeist, the, the the spirit of the time, and combined it with um, you know in, in really fascinating ways to kind of you know take that place, that whole story, to new places. Yeah, it, it's a phenomenal uh, example. Uh, you know, it's that fusion that that we've been kind of alluding to. You know, it was a monster hit because it took the idea, um, you know, that they knew that the audience loved, which was the the, the this whole thing around um, you know high school and what it means to be in high school, and they coupled it with the whole you know the vampire and the werewolf thing. And and so here, you know, and and again, you tip your hat to Mattel because the, they used the equity of the two familiar ideas. To create a new brand that was fun, it was quirky, and yet big enough for people to want to take it to another level themselves. You know, so you had these Frankie Stein and your Dracula, Draculaura and Howling Wolf and Jackson Jekyll and others, and great phenomenal characters that were that were created um, that people could um, you know really connect with. And and now what are we looking at? About a five uh, over five billion dollar property that's just been a phenomenal success. Mm. And I think, uh, you know, people have, have asked us, and, and I think it's worth, you know, talking about, you know, so how then, how do you make a decision? How do you decide whether an idea is going to work or whether an idea is not going to work? And, and you know, our conversation with Turner Classic Movies was, was, was fantastic in that regard because what they did uh, was they found ways to take their premise, which on the face of it looks quite limited. But they found a way to expand it, you know, into into cruises and film and film festivals, wine and film festivals, all those kinds of things. And and what they did it, they, they, I love that quote, uh, Pete, and you'll be able to um, talk more about it. But that quote of uh, that I think was um, they they one of the keys to their success was being prepared to say no, a lot, to how often to when they were pitched ideas. Yeah, J Jennifer Dorian, who's the you know leads that group, she, she kind of knew in her mind what um, what she didn't want. Uh, she wasn't exactly sure what she wanted, but they you know they had brainstormed a tremendous number of ideas, and uh, and and some of these things that were kind of low hanging fruit, she said we're absolutely not going to go there. And then they you know they did this um, you know this first film festival, which was phenomenally successful, and it effectively became their calling card, which was. The term she used, which is is really to say a lot about what they created, and of course, then they were able to take the the film festival concept from Hollywood and put it on a cruise ship, and and that was like Nirvana for for Turner Classic Movies. It was it was f absolutely phenomenal. And I thought the story about the wine was fascinating. You know, that on the one end, you look at that and you go, oh my goodness, you know, that's that is never going to work on the face of it. But the reason it did work was because they had done a really deep study of the demographics and behaviors of their consumers and found that the, the people who were um, 
who were TCM fans loved watching their movies with a glass of wine. So they were able to use that association to actually deepen the experience at the same time as they were able to 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 make it, uh, you know, literally part of part of who they are and how you get to enjoy their brand. Yeah, they they really did dig in and find out those insights and and it's a great example and and I would think that uh, many folks who watch movies like to drink wine and and, and that's what TCM discovered and so they have this great uh, whole branded uh, uh, line of, uh, of wines that you can choose the particular uh, type of grape with the particular type of movie genre that you that you want to watch. Hmm. So I mean all of this when you think about it it comes back to, to, to some basic premises of marketing that are true for all of us, no matter which part of marketing we're involved with, which is know your customer and know them very, very well, and build your offering on a deep, deep understanding of their passions and their interests, because then you will take them to places that they that feel new and yet that they are interested in, in, in seeing more of. Awesome, thank you. Well, gosh, I'm ready to book a cruise. <laughs> that would be that would be awesome. Um, so now let's turn it over for some question question and answers. If anybody in the audience would like to ask our panel questions, please feel free to type that into the questions pane. And again, in your control panel. Um, and I'm going to give you a second to go ahead and do that. All right, we've got one that's come in here. Why do some brands fail in their brand expansion? Do you want to take that, Mark, or would you like me to? Um, I'll start it because I think um, you and I have done quite a lot of work in this. One of the things that uh, is very, you know, I think there are a lot of examples of why brands, of we've seen brand expansion, brand extensions fail. We've seen you know there are numerous examples, and they're often cited by critics of licensing who say, you know, it doesn't work. You're just trying to badge something. But I think it fails when um, when you try and put your a brand on something that doesn't make sense to the consumer. I think if we go back to the TCM example. You know, they did something that came out of a deep understanding of their audience and that made sense to, to that audience because they associated that idea with that brand. Where it fails is when you try and take the brand to a place that consumers just cannot get their heads around for whatever reason in terms of, I, I just don't expect to see the brand there and more to the point, I don't want to see. I don't want to um, engage with the brand in that way. Absolutely, and, and I would just add, you know, and in a couple of examples, if, if people are wondering about the the ones that have failed miserably, you've got uh, Bic, who came out with a line of perfume a number of years back that was a, a, a total debacle, and then you had Colgate, who came out with um, a line of frozen dinners. And and I think what you know you're sharing, Mark, is it really gets around this expansion point. You know, what does the brand bring to the category? Um, if if it doesn't bring something that's meaningful, in, in the words of you know um, the creative director at Bulgari, if it doesn't, if they don't have something to say, then they shouldn't be saying it. And so it's it's how does the how does the brand uh, contribute to the category and, and provide meaning to um, uh, the consumers? And and then ultimately, you know, in, in Keller's words, and, and, and Keller speaks a lot about brand expansion um, uh, and brand extension. You know, uh, will the uh, will the parent brand, um, you know, hurt the expanded the expanded category and, and vice versa? And so, when you look at the examples that we mentioned with Colgate and Bic, you can see where where it just would never have, have flown. Um, but you have another example, uh, Mark, with um, with the Ferrari brand, which I think was really a, a neat example as well. 
Yeah, and it's one, it's one actually that we've included in, in the book, and I think it's a really good um, example of, of how uh, a brand can go into a strange place, or what seems on the face of it to be a strange place, but that actually makes sense. And that is that Ferrari have, have, or have successfully moved into theme parks um, with the introduction of Ferrari World. And when you think about that, um, it makes complete sense that um, a car and a, a car brand that is all about um, uncompromising speed would would put its name to the fastest roller coaster in the world. It makes you know you would expect that to be a, um, you know a, a Ferrari roller coaster. As as I I pointed out um, in a presentation the other day, Pete, and I, I think I was sharing this story with you offline. You know you wouldn't expect it to be Jeep. Mm -hmm. exactly. you know, a Jeep roller coaster, well, that would be an experience, but it would be quite a different experience than a Ferrari roller coaster. And I think what that points to is how strong our associations are with brands and why, when we look at them, we go, that makes sense to me intrinsically, whereas that doesn't. Where brands go wrong is when they try and um, insert a meaning into their brand that is just not palatable to the people who buy from them. Well, and that's another great question. Um, brands that overextend, and this probably wasn't an overextension, but I, I um, when Star Wars came out, um, this last one, and literally there wasn't anything that was out there that wasn't branded Star Wars. It was, it was crazy. I was seeing shower heads and toasters and just literally any and everything you could think of and it was just like wow they really went <laughs> all out there but um, you know and, and they sold quite a bit of, of, of product but um, can you guys give an extent an ex example of when a brand is overextended one that comes in to mind um, right off the top is uh, Pierre Cardin uh, Pierre Cardin was you know high-end uh, luxury uh, apparel brand and accessories and then, uh, then they just started uh, to put their logo on everything and anything, everything from like uh, a can of sardines to ocean uh, ship, uh, sh you know, freight ships. And and so, I, I don't know why those uh, those companies that own those categories thought that there would be value in in the brand uh, on their product. But when it got to that point, um, it really confused the heck out, out of, I think, consumers who knew the brand to mean one thing, and then all of a sudden it was um, not being that thing because it was associated with a whole bunch of categories that were actually um, not aligned with what their what the brand promise and brand position were. How about how about um, and you have anything to contribute on that one, Mark? Um, I'm I'm really interested, uh, Marty. If I can just bring you in here for a moment, when you um, you know when you're looking at the brands that you work with, and you um, and you uh, ext you see a brand you know extend into a new area, and you're you know and you're you're tracking sort of what's happening with them, uh, what signs do you have that a brand um, you know that a brand initiative has is going well? And what are the telltale signs that have you going, hmm, this might not be going where we expected it to go? Well, I mean, everybody has key performance indicators to see which, you know, which and where brands are going. But usually, uh, because of the nature of um, systems and reporting, um, you really only have one barometer, which is the creative tools. How many creative approvals coming in, what kind of approvals? How unique are they? Um, how innovative are they? Um, and if they're not coming in, that means your brand is waning, you know, especially with the target segment that you're after. So it's really only the creative tools that can give you some type of a foresight. The other one people use, and I know Lego uses this extensively, is forecasting. And they, you know, based on forecasts, which are, you know, let's face it, forecasts are typically unreliable, but it gives some indication of what's coming down the road. In the case of Lego, they use that to generate their entire spend plan for the future years. And so forecasts can be an area, along with creative approvals. I think royalties is a really poor area to measure um, how well your brand's doing because it lags. It, whether it's months or quarters, it's just not a good indicator because by the time you got an indicator, your royalties are lagging, uh, somehow you've missed, you've missed the boat. Yeah. 
And I think the other one for me, and I think this alludes directly to what Samantha was, was referring to earlier, is you've also got to be very careful about social media buzz. That on the one hand, um, it, you know, it's good to see conversation, but you can, you can misjudge uh, the popularity or the or the upstream, um, you know, the the upswing possibilities in a brand simply because it has lots of big uh, of uh, buzz on, on social media. And, and one of the things that um, you know, one of the critics of of one of the critics of uh, uh, licensing, L. Reese talks about, you know, is that uh, you can sacrifice the long term equity. Uh, for the short term gain and, and I wonder whether for some of those brands who looked at the Star Wars phenomenon whether they jumped a brand wagon um, at the expense of their long term equity because I would struggle to see how a consumer would see long term value in an association between Star Wars and a shower head. Uh yeah, I would agree with that also, Mark. I, I think that definitely is one where uh, the popularity of the brand is so strong that some of these licensees just want to latch on to it, but they haven't really thought it through um, and, and what it can do for, for, for their company long term. So, and, and what will it do to the brand when, when you see those kinds of things? Well, you know, Mark, Mark Ritson, who, um, who I work uh, you know, who is a columnist on, on BSI, which I also write on, made the really good point that um, that when you tie yourself into a cultural phenomenon, the cultural phenomenon gets a huge amount out of it, but you as a brand don't necessarily do so. And one of the, the one of the interesting points there, Marty, is on the one hand you've got you've got someone like Pokemon where you want to go, okay, we'll help build the phenomenon, but on the other hand you've got to go, or are we just simply transferring that popular uh, cultural icon onto our products in the hope of getting Halo? True. So I think those are all judgment calls for, for brand managers. I mean, if I guess it's the old phrase, if it was easy, all of us would be doing it. <laughs> Well, Sam, I don't know how much time we have left. Um, yeah, I think we're good. Thank you. Um, so what I would love to do, the, what, one other thing I want to mention about, um, about uh, Pete and Mark, um, educational opportunities, and um, also I do understand that you guys are available for doing courses on site. Um, if anyone is is interested in that, would you like to speak a little bit quickly about uh, about your offerings? Sure. So um, the platform that we created was to really help uh, you know brand owners and uh, licensees. Uh, what we say is harness the power of brand licensing. So there is a way to come in uh, and and get that hands-on uh, training that you need, and and it starts with. You know, coming onto the website and and um, you know, getting some free information, and then at that point, you know, kind of understanding what what it is this thing called brand licensing, and then and then if you want to go a little further, we can teach you how to do it, and then and then ultimately a little bit higher, uh, we'll get you to the point where you actually have the tools to do it, and of course, we're always willing to engage directly with people and 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 do workshops for them or 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 speak on the subject to help. Uh, them elevate their overall um, competency for 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 the for the for the category and and how to take advantage like we shared today on our call. Awesome, and in hand with that, Marty is also available. Um, if you need some help in in if you need a resource or you need software a software solution to organize your your licensing business, he's a wonderful resource. We have a great product available. Um, so please reach out. I will do a follow-up email um, with everyone's contact information. But quickly, I'd love to um, get to the free giveaway that we um, we had offered, um, which is uh, a downloading of the Ultimate Brand Licensing Guidebook. And so here are the lucky winners, the uh, five people that have been with us to the end here. Um, we have Yvette Smith, Teresa McAllister, Natalie Wiley, uh, Kali Garba, and my 
Kiyotaki, um, you guys uh, will get a, um, a link. I will send you the information with a code to get a free download of the guidebook. And for anyone else that is interested in purchasing, um, again, that'll be available in our follow-up email. You can go to their website and get more information about um, how to purchase the book and any other services that the gentlemen have to offer. So thank you all for joining us. Please, um, we'll be doing another webinar in February, and that'll be Building Universes, Growing Revenue. And um, we would love for you guys to join us again. Thank you to Peter, Mark, and Marty. Um, I will send a copy of this if you need to get a hold of them. All their contact information is here. And um, we just like to uh, thank everybody for your time. And we will see you in February. Have a very happy new year. Great. Thank you, Sam. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Mark. Thanks, Sam. Right. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, Sam. Thanks, Marty. Take care, Mark. <laughs> Bye. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Bye.